And so it's on to you, Miss Julia. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. I will be sharing my screen and starting the slides. Um, yes, so thank you for joining our presentation. Um, we'll be talking about OER awareness and adoption trends in the US higher education through the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, my name is Julia Seaman. I'm a director of research at Baby Analytics. Um, as well um, in the room, we have Jeff Seaman who will be uh, helping out with the chat and any Q&A at the end as well. Um, so feel free to ask questions during the presentation um, that he can maybe answer or we'll get to at the end. So then this presentation, um, we'll go through an introduction both to Bayview Analytics as well as the survey that we've been performing, uh, talk about the pre-pandemic growth of OER, specifically look at the COVID-19 impact that we were able to measure with our survey last year, and then take some steps in looking at the future of OER. Um, there will be some poll questions as well as time for Q&A at the end. For the poll questions, um, we'll just be using either the um, Zoom chat or um, you can feel free to just sort of think your answer and see how it um, compares to, to the, the correct answer for a few of them or like the general population. So jumping in, uh, my name, as I mentioned, is Julia Seaman. I'm a director of research at Bayview Analytics. Bayview Analytics is a consulting firm um, that focuses on survey design and statistical research. And as I mentioned, Jeff Seaman, um, who's also director of Bayview Analytics, um, is in this room as well. I will we'll be monitoring the chat throughout. Um, relevant for this project is our um, long decade worth of research, um, specifically on OER. Um, so we have been conducting higher education surveys for over a decade. Um, for our higher education group, you can see the years that we performed the surveys um, in this slide, as well as the fact that we do have three additional surveys planned over the next three years. Um, and in fact, we're about to roll out our survey for this year. And so, this um, survey research that I'll be showing today incorporates over 26,000 respondents across 10 surveys. Um, this work uh, specifically today is on higher education, but we also have a corresponding survey in K-12. And so all of these reports um, that we have done are available on our website, which is babyanalytics.com slash OER. So some of the background of the survey, um, so this survey was um, designed and given out with the goal to understand the role of OER in higher education, as well as to quantify perceptions and awareness of OER. And so in order to do this, um, we sent our surveys out to higher education admins, faculty and chief academic officers. So those are our main respondents. And then um, the survey was sent out first by mail um, in the early years. And now we just do it digitally through email and links. But every year that we do this, we do make sure that it is a nationally representative group of respondents. And that includes both for overall geography around the US as well as the type of institution that people are teaching at. And that way we can be sure that the responses that we're getting in aggregate are a very good representative sample. And of course, uh, we wouldn't be able to do the survey without the support of our sponsors. And first and foremost, our sponsor, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, uh, who has sponsored the survey through this entire time, as well as our report sponsors, the OLC, Pearson, Alpha P. Sloan, as well as Kaplan. So um, one important thing for this survey and survey design is that we went into it with the goal to be able to track year over year changes. And in order to do that, we had to make sure that the questions that we used were very similar and standardized every year. And that means, um, and what I'll be showing uh, in this presentation is from the last seven years, we've asked a very similar question around OER awareness. And so that allows us to compare our res responses year over year and therefore be able to track these trends and have confidence in the trends that we are showing. And so for the technical work, um, we also as well uh, make sure that we use the same definitions in the surveys and reports specifically around what we're defining as OER, which you can see the full definition listed here, as well as what is important um, related to OER are the licensing types, specifically public domain and creative commons. So uh, jumping to the first poll question, um, 
how much do you think OER awareness has changed since the 2014, 2015 academic year? So if you want, you can put in chat, um, which whether you think the answer is otherwise, um, feel free to just guess and we'll get to the answer soon. I'm seeing D's and E's, a few C's coming up. Okay, looks like most people, no one's really saying declined, um, but uh, slightly leaning towards the increased 20 to 30%. All right, so we'll jump in. And so jumping in um, for our last report, for the fall of 2020, um, we specifically asked the faculty, how aware are you of OER? And you can see um, from our results that the majority of faculty claim some level of awareness for OER. And so that is asking them and having them self-report, are they very aware, aware, somewhat aware, or not aware? And we like to use these three different variations of awareness um, in order to really distinguish between people who we feel are like truly aware and can be like understand what OER are, and that is the very aware and aware category, as well as give people who do have some name recognition, but maybe not understand what the concept is or how to use it, a way to answer um, the question, which is that somewhat aware category. But overall here, we see that over a majority of the faculty are somewhat aware of OER, and that in fact, almost one in five claim to be very aware of OER. However, now that I've shown you this graph, I'm going to ask, can we actually trust it? Um, and so what we've actually found out through our research is that strictly asking faculty, are you aware of OER, is not actually a very good measurement of OER awareness. Um, we can't trust those numbers exactly. And that is because OER awareness is still growing, and therefore there's a lot of faculty who may actually be confusing OER with things that are free or things that are open source. And therefore, the answers that we're getting to this question alone may be imprecise. So what we come up with is an improved measurement for OER awareness, which requires the combination of both OER awareness as well as the Creative Commons licensing awareness. And so therefore, we count people who are aware of OER if they are aware of both Creative Commons as well as OER. And so this creates a stricter index of OER awareness. And so when we show this, change, we can see the original graph on the left. And then when we adjust it, um, we actually lose roughly 9% of the people from the aware categories. So using the stricter definition, just under half of the faculty are aware of OER at any level. And so you can see um, it goes from just over half to just under half. And so this means with the stricter definition that two in five faculty are very aware or aware of OER in the last year. So as I mentioned, we've been doing this question for multiple years. And so on this graph, I'm showing you that same stricter definition of OER awareness, incorporating Creative Commons awareness and the growth that we have seen year over year. So for our poll question, the correct answer is increased 20%. The exact answer was 23%. And so what has actually been great to see is that this increase, there is a, um, increasing every year, but we see both an increase in the total number. So the whole bar gets bigger, as well as the number who are actually growing aware and the aware level of awareness is increasing. And so um, you can see that because the number who are very aware keeps growing as well. And so um, one thing we will note is that when we are looking at people who are aware of OER, we do see that cost is a commonly cited factor for why they are aware or why they're using OER. So as well as tracking OER awareness, we do also look at OER use. Um, what you can see is that OER use overall is a bit less than OER awareness. Um, and we also see that there are some differences between um, the type of use depending on the courses that the faculty teach. 
But overall, there's growth year over year between um, the use of OER as a required course material and as a supplemental material, though um, the growth in required material is much greater, though it was slowed in the last report that we did. We also note that faculty teaching introductory courses are more likely to use OER as a required material. But that might just reflect the types of material that are well known and available in OER. Um, because that disparity is also much less when we look at any type of material, such as any supplementary material between the faculty. So in conclusion for this section, um, I've shown you that OER awareness and use has grown year over year, but there does um, remain a big confusion about what OER is and how it can be found. Um, not explicitly shown, but what we've seen in the comments is that OER is a tool aligned with current efforts to reduce cost improve opportunities for marginalized students and provide materials that follow new, excuse me, newer teaching standards offering adaptable educational materials. And so I pulled out a few quotes here, which are sort of emblematic of some of the issues facing OER right now. Um, and this first quote is around the support, that while um, there is vague system-wide system statement in favor of OERs, there does not seem to be actual teeth or real support for it. And so this sort of helps explain why there's a higher level of awareness than there may be of use or implementation of OER. And then the next um, quote is really around that um, confusion when it comes down to OER and the licensing. And this is a faculty who mentioned, I'm not entirely clear as to how OER and educational fair use overlap. And while I'm well aware of both concepts, I suspect that most of my colleagues are quite unaware of them. So this is really speaking to that there needs to be a, a lot more education within and to faculty to help them understand the different licensing and different types of materials that are available to them and how they're able to use them. And then finally, this last quote, um, sort of references what I mentioned to improving opportunities for marginalized students and helping students um, receive the best materials that they can and diversify materials to help improve student learning. All right, so then we'll move to the COVID-19 impact. And so this is really focused on some of our questions in our last report about um, how the pandemic has impacted faculty use and faculty textbooks and um, OER awareness. So getting to our second poll question, uh, what proportion of faculty taught face-to-face -face in fall 2020? I'm seeing B, C's, and D's come up. Not sure the full consensus, but okay. Uh, this one will jump right in. And so um, as you may expect, the fall pandemic shifted a ton of faculty to online instruction. And so from this graph, uh, you can see that um, compared to 2019, where we see 96% of faculty reporting teaching face-to-face, only 14% um, were fa teaching face-to-face. -face. So that was B for our poll. And so what we saw was that the fall term was a major shift away from face-to-face -to, -face to online classrooms. And so online, including both fully online as well as blended. And then we also saw, um, and we'll be showing that this change in teaching status had a large impact on the type and use of classroom materials that were used um, by these faculty. So starting in, um, we see that the pandemic drove course changes. Um, and so we specifically asked faculty, how does the version of the course that they're teaching at that moment in fall 2020 compare to previous terms? And so we can see that two thirds of the faculty stated that their courses were moderately or considerably different. And then when we asked what was the reason for the changes to the course, 97% said the changes were um, fully or partly due to the pandemic. And so this is a major shift in courses. We generally do not see this um, year over year. So 
we went in a little further to figure out so can we quantify what some of these changes were specifically related to OER and textbook use? And so when we looked at the textbooks, we asked um, what were the changes? And so um, what came up um, for the fall 2020 were actually a few options around the digital materials. And so while they weren't a majority, um, it was quite interesting how many faculty um, did some digital component to their textbook, either adding an option, switching to all digital, or moving to an inclusive access arrangement. Um, we also see that a lot of faculty, over half, um, did use a newer edition of the textbook, but that is often a normal change um, year over year for faculty to do. When we look specifically at what the changes uh, to the required textbook, we actually see that um, while the courses were markedly different, the faculty were actually using the same textbook than they were um, to the previous year's courses. And so we see only one in 10 faculty reported a change to their textbook. So this sort of indicates that some of the changes for the courses may have been outside the textbook itself. And we saw some of that come up um, with the number of materials that we looked for faculty requiring in their courses. And so while the number of textbooks was the same from the prior year to fall 2020, we do see that there's a larger uptake in other supplemental materials, such as article, case studies, and homework, online homework systems. And so those sort of show that there's a growth of supplemental materials over the COVID-19 pandemic teaching. We also were interested in to know how institutions may have been helping the faculty when it comes to options um, and initiatives for updating their course materials. And so we specifically asked um, the faculty if their institutions took steps to provide course materials. And so on here, um, you can see that while the largest number reported um, was for the institutions providing open educational resources, it was only for 18% of the faculty reporting that. So overall institutions we saw were largely hands off when it came off to updating course materials. Um, interestingly, we did see a slight difference when we looked at institutions that were minority serving versus the other institutions. And so those institutions were much more likely to provide information on OER um, and much less likely to provide information on publisher agreements. Um, so it was an interesting change um, between those types of institutions. We also asked faculty, um, not just their awareness of OER itself, but their awareness of OER initiatives. Um, and so in 20, fall 2020, where we might have expected greater awareness of um, initiatives to grow um, because of the push to online materials that we might expect um, them to have become an uh, sorry, institutions were pushing OER and the OER textbooks and things might uh, be growing and trying to get their attention as the shift to pandemic teaching. We actually see very little change year over year for the faculty awareness of OER initiatives. Um, and so that's at multiple levels, the institution system line department. Um, but this may also be related to the fact that faculty were incredibly busy and so may not have been able to pick up even if the actual output and um, sort of noise coming from the initiatives may have grown. And so for this section, I wanted to um, show you that the COVID-19 pandemic had forced many classrooms to shift to online instruction quickly. Uh, we also saw that the majority of faculty adapted by changing their existing courses and supplementing with digital materials to the same textbooks as prior years. We note that the institutions mostly took a hands-off approach with some providing information on alternatives, but faculty either acting alone or as a committee made the final decisions. And that overall we did um, see, and this is going back to um, the prior section as well, that there was a limited impact to OER awareness and use. And so this is a quote here that I really liked, um, which is coming up that nobody likes changes and most people are only change when forced to. And that's what the, the pandemic has done. And so, some things, activities, assignments, interactions were rendered difficult, impossible, or dangerous by the pandemic, but some new ways of teaching have arisen 
from necessity, some of which will be continued even after all online teaching is no longer required. This is perhaps the one silver lining in the very dark cloud of pandemic disease. And so moving on, uh, really, this is where are we going? What is the future role of OER? And this is actually a much bigger question than it ever has been um, for our past years. And so looking at this, uh, we actually were interested in what factors are like the biggest impact to drive OER adoption. And so when we look at our past surveys and what type of factors are correlated to OER adoption, um, and then what sort of compares to what happened in the pandemic in the last year, uh, we actually see that the major factors are sort of split evenly between things that might really help OER adoption or might actually hinder OER adoption. And so specifically for things that might help, we see that faculty with online teaching experience were more likely to adopt OER, faculty with experience using digital materials were more likely to adopt OER, faculty making changes to their courses were more likely to adopt OER. And all of these things um, definitely grew in the, due to the pandemic, especially with the um, added experience to online teaching and on, using digital materials. And so all three of those might indicate that OER adoption might be growing. However, if we look, um, two factors related to the faculty um, might actually decrease OER adoption. That's specifically the, the faculty really who tend to adopt OER use a luxury of time to be able to search and evaluate the options. And then faculty who do not value supplemental resources are also more likely to adopt OER. And so we saw during the pandemic that a lot of these course changes were very quick and chaotic. Um, and so that sort of rush to continue and adopt um, the best digital materials may actually be a negative for OER, as well as the fact that many faculty, as I showed, um, started using supplemental materials and digital materials, which um, has historically been slightly a negative for adopting OER. And then outside of the faculty themselves, we also know that cost is a very big driving factor for OER adoption. But due to the pandemic and the forced shift to digital, a lot of the commercial publishers have really caught up to OER and what they can offer and how they're describing their materials and sort of um, the commercial publishers have become much more competitive at the OER um, level. And that also includes um, commercial publishers really pushing discounts, all inclusive, inclusive access types of um, options for campuses that definitely cut um, back to the OER, at least on the surface level. And so we do see that there's sort of this push and pull of different trends coming out. And we're really interested into and measuring what factors are really the most driving factors for OER adoption. And so really what we're looking at and what we're excited to um, research is what will the next survey show? And coming out of this, we definitely um, do not expect to know the full impact of the pandemic for the next few years. So we're very lucky to be able to have this project ongoing for a plan three more survey. So hopefully we'll be back every few years to let you know um, how these trends are continuing. So we're coming to our last poll question. And then after this, we'll move to the Q&A. So really, what is your expectation for the level of OER adoption next year? Seeing A's and B's. So generally positive. Looks like A is winning out a little bit. Great. Yes, we are hopeful and optimistic as well. All right. So yes, uh, we can move to the Q&A. I think feel free to type in the chat um, or if you want, specifically maybe raise your hand and we can unmute. Um, as I mentioned, um, I'm Julia from Bayview Analytics. Our email is info at bayviewanalytics.com and our full reports are available on our website, um, not just for this higher ed, but as I mentioned, we have a similar report for K-12. And then we do do a lot of other research within the educational fields too. Um, 
so feel free to ask us um, questions on this and then go through our website and reach out to us if you have questions across any of our research. So yes. Yes, and of course, thank everyone for joining. Um, and we hope you have a great conference. Um, this is the very beginning of a very full um, conference schedule. So one question, did you gather any data, find any correlations on faculty who have time to evaluate OER? Um, so we do ask, touch upon um, what drives OER adoption, but not specifically looking into um, like what time and what exactly they're looking for. I think part of that, uh, we definitely are interested in learning more about um, the factors that they're looking for during their evaluation and what specifically might take more time. Uh, though um, partly we believe it might just be because it's a new thing and that requires both um, their, for them to learn the understanding of it as well as teach others within their department or group or even full institution before adoption. Um, this is Jeff Kamen oh. and I'll let you know that one of the things we did check on this and it's a normal question is um, what, what faculty listed as barriers to their adoption or willingness to find new equipment in which and lack of time was highly cited from many faculty as the component letting them move to material they were not already aware of, OER or anything else, but in particular OER. And then another question, is there any data on whether library assisting with finding OER and how that affects the increase decrease of use? Uh, there's indirect data we have for that, which is if a faculty member is aware of, and this is typically from the library, but not always, some level of incentive or, um, or just a, a publicity program about OER, they are three to four times as likely to adopt than if they're not aware of such a program. So any um, top-down um, incentives or, and it doesn't even have to be incentives, but just uh, publicity awareness pieces that say we talk about the value of OER tends to among faculty who are aware of it, their their level of adoption goes up three to four times. We'll wait a few moments in case there's any other questions. But it, yes, everyone, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we also are very interested, um, these type of questions or anything you'd wanna see on surveys, please let us know. Um, we're always building out and reaching out to faculty admin um, at the higher ed and K-12 level. Um, and as I mentioned, our presentation is on, in the sketch um, description as well as on our website. Yes, all of our reports are published with Creative Commons licenses. Um, and the most recent report are online. Okay. Well, thank everyone for coming. I'll let you out. I think we're a little early. Oh, there might be one. Is anything being added on open pedagogy to the reports? Um, not strictly for this project, I would say. Um, but that is something we do touch upon for a few of our other projects and reports. We have been testing some questions in that area. 
Yes, um, but like OER, part of that is also educating the respondents. So we get a standardized response for it because open pedagogy can mean a lot of different things to different people. Great, um, okay, so I'll let everyone go. Thank you all for joining. Um, hope you have a great conference. Um, and thank you, Beatrice, for monitoring and setting this up. Thank you very much. I will stop the recording. I actually can't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Beatrice is having some uh, technical difficulties, but we'll come back in. Actually, you guys can stop the recording, can't you? Uh, yes.